Hello, everyone. Hi. Yes, it's working. Great. Thank you, all. Um, thank you all for coming today. Good afternoon to this session on innovating financial incentives for nature and climate positive uh, food systems. We do have a bit of a cozy room today, so please feel free to, to go grab a chair. And if, no, if there are no chairs left, feel free to stand along the edges. Um, so the room is not the only thing that's a bit cramped. We also have a very tight program today, so we, we'll try to stick to time um, and uh, run through a very nice and pleasant engaging uh, event with you today. Um, so just to give a little bit of context of the, of the session today, we have um, an opening by BMZ shortly um, on a compensation initiative, which has been uh, an initiative launched by BMZ last year on um, compensation mechanisms for, uh, for food systems uh, and nature positive uh, transformation. Um, and after that, it's perhaps good to already uh, inform you, is that we will have a very informal, uh, fun, but um, strict uh, competition uh, between three, initi three initiatives that we have invited today. This is also why on my, my left, you're right, there's one of the judges who will be helping us with um, scoring the, the projects is sitting here. Uh, and next up, we have one, uh, one judge sitting in the audience. Uh, there, uh, she will be helping us also. But uh, the challenge here is that she doesn't really speak English that well. So we have inv invited a translator so she can be participating in this session. Um, so she'll be involved in the, in the, uh, the competition later on. Uh, and then as lastly, we'll invite um, representatives from the World Bank and Climate as well to discuss a little bit on the repurposing agenda uh, and some work that Climate has been doing in Malawi uh, this year with the national government and the World Bank on repurposing subsidies uh, for agricultural inputs. Uh, so with that, uh, I would like to invite Ms. Felicitas Rerich, Senior Policy Officer at, uh, at BMZ, to help me uh, set the context for the session um, and invite some of the, or already introduce some of the project, uh, the competition projects. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wiebe. Wow, it's a full room. That's great to see. <laughs> Dear ladies and gentlemen, it's a really great. Great pleasure to welcome you all here to this side event that is jointly hosted by the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, CLIMEAT and GIZ, and featuring the Compensation Initiative. Compensation has been initiated as a deliverable of the German G7 presidency, and it has since been led by the BMZ. The initiative has been born from the vision that agriculture produces worldwide should receive adequate compensation for the multifunctional services that they provide. Smallholder farmers are the producers of our food, the stewards of our land, and of natural carbon sinks. They contribute to climate change mitigation and adaptation and important public ecosystem services. Yet the services are not adequately honored. Climate finance contributions for mitigation adaptation action in small-scale agriculture is small. It's actually alarmingly small, given the fact that the majority of people is directly dependent on agriculture and already heavily affected by climate change. Meeting actual financial needs will require redirecting existing finance flows and raising new finance. A new generation of payment mechanisms, so-called compensation mechanisms, for the provision of ecosystem services in agricultural systems could increase the income of small-scale men and women farmers, incentivize resilient and low-emission agriculture practices, and mobilize public and private funding to small-scale agriculture. And with this idea in mind, at last year's COP, we officially launched the Compensation Initiative and this year, I'm really happy that we're here again to present you some interesting updates so far. Now, last year at the COP, when we launched the initiative, we also launched a partnership with IFAD and provided 15 million euros to pilot different compensation schemes in three different countries under IFAD's adaptation for smallholder agriculture program. In Brazil, a project is being implemented to establish a financing system for incentivizing deforestation-free value chains. In Ethiopia, they're building a system for carbon certification and agroforestry systems. And in Lesotho, partners are developing a national fund for payment for ecosystem services. And this is showing first results. 
I'm honored to have Mr. Mofili Motsetsero from Lesotho with us today, who will present us latest achievements from Lesotho. Together with IFAD, we are currently also developing another partnership agreement to jointly invest some 14 million euro into SAF, a blended finance facility for smallholder agroforestry that is recently established by ACORN under Rabobank. The idea here is to strengthen this financing facility for the pre-financing of carbon projects in smallholder agriculture and to de-risk and attract investments from the private sector. It's a great pleasure to have Mr. Roland van der Forst from Rabobank showcasing the SAF model today. And of course, payment for existing services schemes come in many different ways and forms, and they need to be as diverse as smallholder farmers' realities are. Therefore, I'm very pleased to also have Ms. Pauline Nantongo with us presenting EcoTrust's model for conservation of finance. EcoTrust delivers conservation finance for thousands of smallholders, uh, smallholders undertaking restoration as a business model in rural communities. Mr. Mofili Mozzetero, Mr. Roland van der Forst, and Ms. Pauline Nantongo will introduce us three very different PS schemes and speak about the challenges and potentials from their unique perspective. And then our judging team of Ms. Nady Morales, a farmer leader from Guatemala, and Ms. Elisa Villarino from the Alliance of Biodiversity and SEAT will subsequently ask questions and share reflections. Now, after this friendly competition, Compensation has another great achievement to share. In the framework of the Food Systems 2030 Trust Fund of the World Bank, to which BMZ provided more than 120 million, last year, million euros last year, a large share of which is used to support the agenda of repurposing harmful agricultural subsidies towards more sustainable practices, we're working with the World Bank to explore ways to setting up PS schemes aligned with compensation goals for the repurposing of public support. And so, in col collaboration with CLIMEAT, first evidence could be created in Malawi, captured in a brand new and exciting policy brief on payments for soil health services that will also be launched just today in the session. And it is a great honor to have Martin van Nieuwkop, the Global Director for the Agriculture and Food Global Practice of the World Bank, and Bruce Campbell from CLIMEAT with us today to speak about the experience in Malawi and launch the policy brief. Ladies and gentlemen, finance is a game changer for the transformation of agriculture and food systems. I believe that compensation has the potential to substantially contrib contribute to a restructuring of current finance flows in a way that more funds will be directed to smallholder farmers and finance sustainable practices. The time for compensation is now. I'm looking forward to a lively competition and I cannot wait to hear the feedback of our esteemed judges and also of you, the audience. I would like to emphasize the compensation initiative serves as an open space for all that pursue a similar goal. So I encourage you to participate and join forces. Feel free to reach out and you can find here a QR code, which I encourage you to follow. It will lead you to our website, compensation.com, where you can find more information. And with this, I hand back to Wiebe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Felicitas. You did such an amazing job at already introducing all our speakers that you took some of the work of my hands, so thank you very much. The only thing I would like to add is that while we are entering this friendly competition is that we have asked the presentations to be quite brief, so we have challenged them a little bit in that sense, um, but also to focus on three main topics in these uh, presentations. And these are the three topics or categories on which we will later also um, base our answers to the question which of the projects are doing best or performing best in your opinion in these respective categories. So the first category that we'll be looking at is how these financial models are actually delivering for uh, smallholder farmers on the ground. Uh, the second category will be on how sound their fin financial model is, so they will also present something around the financial models that you're using. And the last uh, last category will be on the scaling potential because of course there's so much need for these kinds of initiatives. But and we need to have these projects to scale to actually get an impact on a, on a large, uh, large scale. Um, so with that, 
um, I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Morfili Mozzizero to come to the front uh, and ask the tech support to put on the, the slides so that uh, Mr. Morfili can uh, present his project to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Weber. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as they have said, I am Mofitli Mosetsero. I come from the beautiful country of Lesotho. It is, um, yes, yes, yes. Um, we are working for this project called uh, Regeneration of Landscapes and Livelihoods. It is a project based mainly on, on regenerating life uh, 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 landscapes. And then um, Lesotho is mostly known for its beautiful waters, beautiful uh, mountains. That's where, th that's where we live. So the project, uh, if you can see, is working in those subcatchments that are listed there. It's not working throughout the country, but uh, the, the idea is beyond the life of the project, now we'll upscale to, to other subcatchments. Um, we have uh, three main components in this uh, project, but I'm going to talk about uh, this one mainly, which is the one that uh, we are going to talk about in terms of uh, payment for, for ecosystem services. So the project mainly is regenerating the, the, the landscapes and then it's bring, giving back to the communities through livelihoods uh, improvement. So what we do is we mobilize resources that uh, we work with the farmers, we work with the communities to ensure that they take care of their, 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 their environment. And, and what we have realized is that over years, these issues have been uh, there in terms of land degradation, but the main challenge has always been the mindset of the people. So our project mainly focuses on changing the mindset of the people so that they understand the value of natural resources. They understand that with the natural resources, they can be able to improve their livelihoods. Um, yes, so I'll go straight to the payment for ecosystem services. We understand that in fact, in, in Lesotho, our land is communally uh, owned. So for, for it to be, for, for, for them to take care of that land, they have to work together because there are a lot of interest groups that are, uh, have interest in the natural resources. So now, how are we going to, or how are we looking at the payment for, for ecosystem services? I said Lesotho is mostly known for its beautiful waters. What we are doing currently is we are building big dams and then we are transferring water to uh, the neighboring countries, South Africa, Namibia, and Botswana. So the source of that water is mainly the wetlands. So if those wetlands, we don't take care of those wetlands, it says there will not be water flowing downstream to the downstream users. So what we are doing is those, that water which is flowing to South Africa, the royalties that are coming from uh, the sale of that water, part of it is brought back into the communities so that they continue to take care of the environment uh, so that those waters, those water sources and the water bodies which are the wetlands will keep on generating water, will keep on giving water to the neighboring countries and Lesotho itself. But also, <coughs> When we plow back to the, uh, yeah, this is the, the, the model that shows that um, downstream here, oh, okay, the pointer is not working. Maybe it's not me. So downstream here is the users of the natural resources, so we need to take care of these people who are upstream so that they don't disturb the, 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 water, the water sources. Good. So... The other important issue is that um, after we, oh, I'm left with two minutes. After these people have uh, got the, the royalties from the water, we bring it back to the communities. And one of the, the, the main issues is, is, is the production of wool and mohair in Lesotho. That's where um, our rangelands, the, 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 the wool producers benefit from those rangelands because they get, uh, uh, that's where they get their, their feed. So if we improve the, 
if we improve, okay, let me let me pass this one because of time, and, and, and come straight to wool because that is our our main game changer. If we improve the range length, now we improve the quality of our sheep and goats. And if we improve the quality of the sheep and goats, now it goes directly to improvement of wool, which is our main commodity that we are exporting. And if we get the good quality wool, it says communities and uh, people now are going to improve, improve their life. So these are some of the examples of uh, uh, what is already happening in Lesotho in terms of uh, wool production uh, and the likes. But as, I, as you saw from the previous slides, we are also very uh, uh, looking at ecotourism, which is another uh, area which we are looking to improve the livelihoods of the, of the people. I'm told time is on my side. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mofilia. Please, please don't run, Mofilia. You're not done yet. We still have a little small component for you left. That's why we, yeah, we invited two experts uh, with us in the room that will ask you very brief questions, and then we'll allow you to give a very brief answer. And I would like to stimulate you to try it and to say it, to answer it in such a way that you will convince the audience here that the project that you are running in Lesotho is actually the best of the projects today. Uh, so perhaps I'll ask uh, Senora uh, Morales uh, first if she would like to. Uh, to give a question. So it will be in Spanish, but it will be translated for you. So feel free to uh, answer in English as well. Claro. Eh, sí, mi pregunta es si esta iniciativa ha tomado en cuenta eh, la formulación participativa de las comunidades eh, para que en el tiempo, si las comunidades sientan más identificación y esto también pueda, pueda potenciarlo. Y de ser así, ¿se ha considerado alguna práctica ya existente desde las comunidades para poder potenciar aún más esta iniciativa? ¿Y cuánto o cómo en realidad es que los productores pueden beneficiarse de esta iniciativa? Gracias. Okay, I'm just going to translate for her to English. So it's just like a long question. So the first part is if uh, this initiative considers or like if it's participative enough, like if it considers, um, you know, like the community in a general sense and like just to guarantee like the social sustainability of the initiative and also um, if it um, has a, if it, takes into account more or less like the current initiatives or like the current practices that the communities are uh, already like implementing and also how much the farmers get in that compensation mechanism. So okay. those three elements. Muchas gracias. So that's the first component on the, the participatory aspect. And then might I already ask uh, you for another uh, question, if you have one. Oh, you, you have, you're mic'd up, so I hope yeah, you I like to... I spoke with him before this because I found the project quite innovative. Because normally when you think about PES, it's about you know something to do with ecosystem. This one has something to do with the value chain. So I just ask him, you know, what what happens if you have this improved wool? Are you, uh, is this mean it attracts more buyers or do you get to export or something like that? Because it really goes beyond the ecosystem when you think about it. So I just want to find out from him uh, ab about that. Uh, what does it mean? What's the scenario if he, they would have good quality? Wool as an uh, effect of this uh, project. Okay, thank you very mm -hmm. much, Alisa. So now it's up to you, Mofili. You have 30 seconds to one minute <laughs> to convince the audience that you're doing the best project here. So. Thank you very much, and thanks for those questions. Uh, in terms of inclusivity, our project, as I said, we, 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 we are looking at coalitions. So, coalition landscape coalitions are all the uh, uh, interested people in do in that landscape. For example, you have the the, the Ulian Mohe producers. We have uh, other members of the community who are doing. Uh, an example is at the back there. You see that beautiful lady wearing a hat there. In the rangelands, you will find the grass that we do those things, and they are good for for ecotourism also. Um, so, so everybody is included. Uh, we are looking. We, we are using what is called a, a community participatory uh, a method. So, in terms of in terms of the benefit that we are getting, uh. um, the world now is moving into a, 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 a pay more for environmentally produced commodities. So, if you improve wool, it says it's going to fetch better prices in the market. 
And if you, you have a proof that yes, it has been produced under environmentally sound uh, 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 scenarios, then there's another 15 to 20% markup price over the total amount of the price that you get. Right. But we are also looking at what we call slow foods. Slow foods is mainly a, a, a grass-fed a meat. So it also is also fetching a lot of uh, uh, good prices in the market. Uh, it's like naturally or, or organic food, but since we don't have any chemicals in those rangelands, then the meat that we produce is one of the best. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, Mofili, indeed, a round of applause. Now I'll let you go back to your seat. Thank you so much. So that was our first contender of the day. So then I'd like to invite the second, who is Mr. Roland van der Forst, uh, Head of Innovation at the Rabobank and also CEO at the Rabo Carbon Bank to give us a presentation on the Acorn SAF uh, initiative. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, let me start. I think we have, yeah, we have some slides. Let me start with this story. Um, three and a half years ago, uh, I was only Head of Innovation for the Wholesale Rule business at that time. I read this article that within three and a half years, it will be possible uh, to monitor from the sky at a very granular level the growth of trees, okay? So then we said, hey, this is interesting because growth of trees is biomass. Biomass captures carbon. Hey, this is interesting. So we did research for smallholder farmers and we said, okay, what if we would incentivize smallholder farmers to put a few plants on their land, agroforestry, it's extremely good for the, for the soil. Um, we measure from the sky the growth of the tree and we turn that into a high qualitative carbon credit and we sell it to companies who are very, uh, very uh, serious about uh, reducing their own com emissions but also want to comp compensate. That was the basic idea. Uh, so two and a half years ago, we started with that idea. 80% of everything we earn, so 80% of everything we earn goes directly to the small the farmer. 10% uh, to the project uh, organizations and 10% to the bank. So that is basically what the, the first uh, four slides will tell us in a short notice. So this is what we do. We see small the farmers, we measure, uh, certify the biomass, we turn that into a carbon removal unit, and then we sell it. So this is the, fir this is the first principle we do. So what do we do? We have uh, farmers, of course, they plant trees. We have local partners that collect the data, like for instance, Farmstrong in every country, we have local partners. Then we come, we measure, measure the biomass, we generate crews, and we have our own satellite uh, company. So I have uh, uh, people, so I have 12 people in my team, remote sensing specialists. It is certified by an external uh, certifier, and then um, companies buy those crews. Not only the Microsofts, but uh, more and more we do insetting, so um, the partners in the value chain are interested in buying those uh, carbon removal units. Um, why, is it, why is it good? It ticks a lot of boxes. It's good for uh, food, food insecurity at this moment, uh, climate change, of course, and land degradation. As you know, smaller farmers are really suffering from land de uh, de uh, degradation. And agroforestry is the method to fight those uh, challenges. So what, uh, there's a lot of uh, turmoil in the carbon credit market. What makes us, so I'm very skeptical, to be honest. Uh, uh, what makes us different? Well, we're very reliable. Um, for instance, one of the very interesting things and important things that we only measure a, a CO2 that already has, the sequestration that already has taken place, ex post. So this is a very important uh, qualitative, uh, so it's not a promise for the future, it's actually sequestered carbon. We are extremely transparent. Uh, every, everything is on our website. You can even see on a project basis where you can find the c credits and how are they, they are uh, being uh, generated. Um, and there are a lot of co-benefits. Uh, I uh, Very simple, we use the carbon price. We have a very good price, uh, $35 now for a carbon unit, which is good. And why is that? Because of the co-benefits. The benefits far exceed carbon. There are social benefits. If you see 6 million, only this year, 6 million euros directly has gone to small the farmers. Um, directly, so it, it really supports livelihoods. Uh, they can send their kids to school. It's a substantial 
addition to the income of smallholder farmers, but also there are big biodiversity uh, uh, benefits. So we're not talking about large-scale scale, uh, uh, planting. It is something which really protects the biodiversity scheme. So this is already, so we started uh, two and a half years ago, and these are all the countries we are already, so it's extremely scalable. We have the projects in place, and it's extremely scalable. What is an impediment to scale? Finance. Why? Because you have to pre-invest in the seedlings and the trees. So how are we going to do that? So this is what we have done. We have set up a fund. So what we've done is a, 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 a credit facility, uh, sorry, a fund which works very simple. It has tranches, of course, investors uh, who invest in the fund. So we're setting up the fund now, 100 to 200 million. The investors get paid by the revenues of the carbon credits which makes this an extremely secure investment. So 80% normally goes to the farmer. We keep 40% for the investor to actually as to repay the loan. And then after the loan is being repaid, of course the farmer gets the 80% again. So for a farmer it's great because there's no risk. The only thing he has, to, he doesn't have to bring money to the table. The only thing he or she has to do is plant trees and we take uh, and, and we extract uh, uh, we we make sure that the funds are being generated for agroforestry another big co benefit is agroforestry actually improves yield over time so i think it's an extremely interesting method where we try to uh, get more security into the system which of course is one of the big pitfalls in 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 um, in, in financing smaller farmers there's a lot of uh, risk involved and here we uh, we have a final way to uh, mitigate the risk. I think this is five minutes. Any questions? Thank you very much, uh, Roland, for that. And like for the previous contender, I will go to our uh, expert uh, judges to ask you some final questions. So, uh, Senora, uh, tienes una pregunta por uh, Roland? Sí, claro. Eh, en nuestros territorios o en nuestra región, el tema de la conflictividad agraria por eh, el interés en los bosques es muy alto. En un periodo tan largo eh, de 20 años, ¿cómo es eh, el mecanismo o el requerimiento en el tema de la, tenen de la seguridad de la tenencia de la tierra en este sistema? ¿Trabajan con eh, parcelas sin, sin una titulación eh, jurídica como tal o cómo es el mecanismo? Um, yeah, so basically the question is regarding um, titles. So in countries like uh, Central America, she's from Guatemala, so there's a lot of social uh, conflict regarding uh, land in general. So how can you secure, like in a period of 20 years, how can you secure, a, you know, like this kind of mechanism? And also is it required to have land title? Thank you very much. Muchas gracias. Uh, Elisa, you also have another question? Yeah, I have a question. So what's so far the level of interest from potential finan uh, funders? Because you said that's the problem. So I wonder well, if you did a, an analysis. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> Am I still? Yeah. Shall I first go to that and then to that? Mm -hmm. it's, it's very interesting. We're talking to uh, USAID, or USAID uh, World Bank, which I hope we have some commitments from big investors as well. Mm -hmm. We as Rabobank also chip in. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, yeah, I cannot disclose everything, but it, we're, there's, there's huge... I, I'm totally uh, conf confident that we will have uh, the 100 million uh, in the quarter okay. first uh, next year, because we already have some, at least a lot of soft commitments, yeah. some hard commitments, because we as a bank also chip in. Yeah. Uh, we have first loss commitment uh, for USAID, for instance, so there are, there are already... We, we do. But uh, again, we need <laughs> investors, so anyone who wants to chip in, please do so. Okay. This is a very good question. So, of course, but there are more risks involved than only uh, land conversion. There is risk of uh, um, uh, fires, for instance. Uh, there, so, in, in this tenor, there's, there are a lot of risks. So, what we've done is part of the uh, revenues, we keep them apart to deal with those risks. So, it's a sort of cooperative structure, you could say, where the different for all the farmers uh, have a percentage of their revenues put into a pool for for these kinds of accidents uh, so this is the way we make it mitigate it another thing is we are we do the ground truth data ourselves so we measure the polygons uh, we we so that's all in our own uh, we see and we, we measure it also from the sky so there's a huge <coughs> monitoring uh, part which we do uh, that's why hence so many 
people in the uh, in the bank in my team who are doing that because that secures the quality. But of course, accidents happen, but we uh, we have uh, counted those in financially. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Roland. Excellent. So we've had already two of our great contenders today. So then I'd like to invite the last of the contenders to come up for her presentation. So Pauline Nantongo, the executive director of EcoTrust Uganda. So please. OK. Um, yes, uh, thank you very much. I hope I know how this thing works. I work for an NGO that uh, specializes in conservation finance. OK. <laughs> Uh, which other one? Okay, and how do I move? Okay, so we work, we, it's a smallholder designed, implemented for smallholder farmers. We try to locate our projects to overlap with key biodiversity areas. Where the purple is, is where our projects have already overlapped with key biodiversity areas. And the green is where we intend to cover because every investment that we make delivers biodiversity, conservation benefits, climate change adaptation and mitigation benefits, as well as um, livelihoods benefits. So it works as a, <coughs> um, a business, a smallholder-led business, where um, we support landscape restoration as a business. And our main intervention is towards transforming the investment horizon of the smallholder. The smallholder is desirous of having a resilient landscape. They are desirous of living in harmony with wildlife. They are desirous of having food security and everything. The, only cha the main challenge they have is this long-term investment horizon. They spend their days thinking about school fees, uh, food security, taking your child to hospital, and so on and so forth. So they can't quite afford that luxury of, of doing everything that they would like to have on a long term. So what we do, we sit down with them, recognize them as investors that are bringing on board their land, their labor, their knowledge, and everything. And then we also co-invest with them. So together we sit with them and work out the primary investments. How much land, what land use system, for what management objective. Then we, we operate what we call a blended financing model. So we take that uh, initiative to the public sector. We get public financing to invest into the secondary investments, which are the technical specifications. So the smallholders plan the land, they plan the restoration. But then as experts, we technically specify those, in, those uh, land use initiatives to quantify the carbon benefits, the water benefits, the biodiversity benefits, to be able to commoditize them. Then we, we take that to the, to the market. So we engage with private sector from three different, from three different angles. Through the insetting angle, which Econ already described, working with private sector that sources their products from that landscape, such that together with them, we would invest in, um, in initiatives that would make the supply chain sustainable. The second one is the off-taking initiative where a private sector offset their carbon footprint through our landscape. The third one is the off-taking. If, if the smallholders invest in the growing of timber, fruit, whatever it is, honey, and it never gets to the market, they will abandon that land use. So it's important that whatever the landscape is supporting is able to access the, the, the land use. So here, we create diversified income streams for the smallholder farmers. We've created an endowment fund. We use a model that is different from, uh, from them. We use an ex-ante model. We are Ugandans, we are a poor CSO and what have you. We do not have the luxury of having funds to invest. So the market prefinances us. So we use an ex-ante model. Our carbon credits are issued before they take place. But we also risk manage. We use very conservative estimates. We also have a self-managed risk fund that uh, supports uh, farmers that have been disproportionately affected by extreme weather conditions. But above all, we come up with a very good value proposition 
to the smallholder that they have no reason for abandoning uh, that land use. <coughs> then the, sec the other thing, these are, this is where all the money that we've been able to mobilize from public sources, from private sources. And uh, the other thing that we do, the way we deliver the money, we use it to create a credit history for the smallholder farmer. Then we also create alternative collateral. In Uganda, people have land, but they don't have land titles. Mm -hmm. So you don't have evidence that you have uh, security. But we also don't want their land to be encumbered because it's the most significant resource that they have. So we, pro we use the carbon agreements they have with us or the payment for environmental services agreements we have with us as collateral for loans. We are the future cash flows are what protects the loans. And then that way, you're able to create several income streams kicking in at different stages of, uh, of uh, the environment, I mean, of the uh, investment horizon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Pauline, for that presentation. So for the last presentation, I will also ask our judges to come up with some questions. Uh, Senora Morales, por favor, un pregunta. Bueno, sin duda es un enorme trabajo el que se realiza para poder restaurar estos paisajes. Eh, en realidad, sí compensa todo ese esfuerzo, eh, esta, valga la redundancia, esta compensación, porque entiendo que tengan eh, un sistema para mitigar los riesgos, pero con todo el tema del cambio climático, ¿qué pasaría si uno de estos paisajes eh, se destruye por altas precipitaciones, por un incendio o por intensas sequías? ¿Cómo mitigan ya en el campo esas situaciones? Um, yeah, so she's asking if this compensation mechanism at the end of the day, like how much it actually compensates the farmer. So in a situation of like climate change or like very, you know, like extreme um, natural events, like where everything is destroyed, like at the end of the day, how they can make sure that they're actually compensated after all the effort of taking care of the landscapes. Muchas gracias. Elisa? Yeah. So <coughs> my question is, I actually have some, a lot of questions about because we don't have a lot of time. Uh, every time you commoditize something, there are risks to that. What, have you thought about some of this risk and if you have some safeguards that you have put in place because it's an innovative model, right? But anytime you do something like commoditize, I <laughs> that comes with a lot of concerns. Um, and, and I think the, the questions are related. The questions are related because it's about risk and also what are we compensating. So from our perspective, it is risky not to do anything. We are, we, are <clears throat> we are suffering with drought, we are suffering with floods, we are suffering with all those things. So when we are sitting and designing, we are not designing a system to access the carbon market. We are building a system that, we are designing a system that will build our own resilience. And the investments that we need to make to build our resilience. Then we take a step back and say, okay, while we go about our own resilience building, we also offer services to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. So that is what we commoditize and sell and bring in the financing to support our own mm -hmm. resilience. Mm -hmm. So, so for, from our perspective, it's not even a compensation. It's, a, it's an adaptation, it's a resilience building uh, exercise. And there's, there's so much to compensate about. We live in a, in a landscape that has biodiversity, but has, that has, for example, uh, chimpanzees, mm. but has been fragmented over the years. But the chimpanzees don't care that this is a protected area and this is a farm. So they roam about, we suffer crop raids and all manner of human wildlife conflict. So one of the things that we have done is we are planting trees to create um, a, 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 a passageway uh -huh. for where the chimpanzees can migrate in between the large forest blocks. So then we have biodiversity credits because we are improving biodiversity, but also we are protecting our own human wildlife conflict. Uh -huh. So that is basically how it works. It does not start as a compensation, it starts as a, a resilience building uh, program. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, indeed, a round of applause. And Pauline, I would like to ask you to stay up front uh, because it is, a, it is a competition, Pauline. So actually, I'd like to ask you to come back to the front and actually also the other two contenders, if it's OK to come to the front, because the competition, unfortunately, or it's no matter how you see it, needs a winner. Um, so 
We thought of an easy way to determine uh, who the winner would be for the different categories. Um, it might not be the most scientifically sound manner of measuring success, but uh, what we would like to do is to ask you in the audience to applaud for the project that you think scores best in the respective categories. And like I mentioned at the start, we have, uh, we have three categories. So I want to go to the first category, which is the, the benefits for smallholder farmers on the ground. So who do you think benefits most uh, from the from the project um, that was presented. So perhaps if you think it was uh, the first project, so that's Mr. Mofili here in the middle, the role project. If you think his project addresses the needs of the small the farmers most, please give a round of applause. Okay. That's a good start, Mofili. That's a very good start, Mofili. <laughs> Do you think the Rabobank Acorn project scores the best when it comes to addressing smallholder farmers' needs? Okay, okay, it's more or less, more or less similar. <laughs> and then the last, so do you think Pauline's presentation on Ecotrust Uganda is the best project to address smallholder farmers' needs? Oh, wow. That's a very difficult one. Here we lack the, the measure of science to, to make sure to determine who it was. So let's call it a tie. Um, <laughs> then we go to the second category. We, they've all managed. Their, uh, they've all presented their uh, financial models that they're using. Mm -hmm. So, which of the financial models you think is most sound in making sure that also finance in the end uh, ends up with smaller farmers? Uh, so, do you think it has been Mofili's presentation initiative in Lesotho that does best when it comes to finance flows? Good. You've been doing very well, Mofili. You get a lot of applause. <laughs> very good. Do you think Rabobank's ACORN initiative is the best when it comes to uh, funding models? <laughs> very good one, very good round. Or do you think it has been Pauline's Ecotrust Uganda that addresses these uh, fu funding models the best? Okay. All three score good uh, in both categories, I think, so it's all very good. Uh, maybe the last one, Rabobank, you did very well in the last round, so we might give it to you. <laughs> And then finally, the last uh, is on the scaling potential. Like we mentioned, we need to make sure that we reach scale uh, to also uh, reach many farmers. So when it comes to the scaling potential of the different initiatives, do you think that Mofili's uh, first presentation uh, scores best here, the role project? <laughs> Very good. Is it Rabobank's Acorn project that does best when it comes to scaling? Also very good. Or is it the last Pauline's Ecotrust Uganda that does very well and comes also very good? So I think uh, the lesson here is that all projects do great work. <laughs> so thank you all for uh, presenting your uh, initiatives. <laughs> we might invite you back next year to measure indeed uh, the progress made so far to see who actually did best. No. But thank you all very much for joining the competition. Uh, so please feel free to find your seats. Uh, and then we'd like to move to the last section of uh, the session today, uh, which is on addressing the repurposing agenda for funding, uh, with a specific link to Malawi. So my colleague uh, Bruce Campbell has been implementing some work in Malawi this year on repurposing uh, subsidies uh, together with the National Government of Malawi and the World Bank. Uh, so it's my pleasure to first invite Mr. Martin van Nuko uh, Nukoop, a Global Director for Agriculture and Food at the World Bank, to uh, give some key notes. Thank you. Well, very good, um, and a big thank you, I mean, to the uh, organizers um, for inviting me to participate in this very nice event today. And I'm very pleased to share some innovative work that the World Bank has been doing to put into practice, you know, the financial incentives for nature and climate positive uh, food systems. I, I think, you know, the, the competition that we just saw, I mean, really provided a good flavor of all the in potential innovations that are out there when it comes to payment for ecosystem services. Actually, I'm very pleased about it because one of the things that we want to put forward uh, in the bank is that you know we want to kind of try uh, to, to, to change the notion of what it means to be a successful farmer in the, to, in the 21st century, not just a producer of food, but also a provider of ecosystem services. So I think this work that we've seen here is putting that notion into practice. Uh, we also think that farmers should be producers of renewable energy so that actually in the future, farmers have three revenue streams rather than one. Uh, so maybe next year we do a competition on renewable energy on, on farms or something. 
Um, but I think also the presentations very much underscore the complexity of the challenges that we face, because I think the settings were all different, and of course also the scaling pro probably in country as well as international. Um, but clearly, um, when you take a step back and you look at food systems, um, we really need to boost climate uh, finance to achieve a sustainable and inclusive transformation of the food system. And if you make to have to make real progress towards the SEC and the climate goals, we need to make sure that public financial incentives are properly aligned. And current agriculture support is substantial. In many countries, it's $800 billion per year, according to the OECD globally. But it is not well aligned uh, to really generate sustainable outcomes. Actually, we've done research together with uh, IFPRI uh, that actually shows that um, um, this, this support actually is part of the problem and actually is generating negative environmental uh, outcome. And therefore, we think that repurposing is very important. Uh, and that will not only increase the development effectiveness of domestic finance, um, which is scarce, and many countries are indebted, but we think it will also unlock larger flow of external finance uh, if, 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 if donors see higher efficiency and effectiveness of domestic resource financing, including from inst international institutions like the World Bank. We are very much looking to that. Um, and we also think, I mean, um, uh, that um, repurposing would also provide a more conducive, enabling environment for um, the, the, the private sector and private sector financing to come in. Now, um, we have been working uh, to kind of go beyond what we're saying and realize those objectives. Uh, so we have provided technical support to over 30 countries right now on repurposing public support to agriculture and putting that money to better use. Um, and we also need to recognize there, and this is also from the work that we've done with the International Food Policy Research Institute, that for every dollar in public support provided to agriculture, only 35 cents actually hand, ends up in the hands of the farmers. Uh, and we have been working, as I said uh, earlier as well, I mean, to our multi-donor trust fund, Food Systems 2030, um, to back this up by providing also financing. So bes besides the analytics upstream, also providing uh, seed money for countries to start implementing uh, the repurposing agenda, including in Malawi. Um, now, let me, let me actually take a step back here. And I don't know whether you have seen uh, that on, I think it was on Friday, um, uh, the, the, the UAE presidency announced, I mean, the declaration on sustainable agriculture, resilient food systems, and climate action that was uh, adopted by 134 countries. And actually, they told me yesterday that an additional three countries actually have signed off on it. But I want to read one. I want to read one action uh, that actually is stated, you know, in that uh, declaration. And actually, it reads like revisit or orient policies and public support related to agriculture and food systems to promote activities with increased income, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and bolster resilience, productivity, livelihoods, nutrition, water efficiency, and human, animal, and ecosystems health, while reducing food loss and waste and ecosystem loss and degradation. So the point is, this is actually language. Um, you know, it doesn't say repurposing because it's a little bit politically charged. So for that reason, the word revisiting, but the intention and the spirit is actually the same. So that actually, besides the work that we have been doing now in 30 countries, 137 countries signing up to this declaration that has this word, you know, this is actually real momentum in the right direction. And actually, US signed off on it, China signed off on it, the European Union, Nigeria, uh, Brazil, Indonesia, so big countries um, that actually um, um, make a big difference actually signed off on it. And of course, many others as well, 137 total. Um, now, on Malawi, uh, Malawi, uh, used to allocate about 10% of the national budget to agriculture, which is a good thing. I mean, this is in accordance with the CADEP um, uh, objective. But the problem is that the majority of this support is provided to input subsidies, uh, and those have not delivered results. I mean, productivity really remains low, and that is uh, kind of further complicated by climate change, and poor practices, uh, soil degradation. So in collaboration with Climb Eat and with the support of the German government, uh, we are assisting the, the government of Malawi to, to improve the efficiency and the efficacy of public expenditures and repurpose them to incentivize uh, productivity, to incentivize crop diversification and sustainable land management practices. Uh, 
And then specifically what we are working on now, and I think we will, we will back that up with significant support um, uh, beyond the seed money that we already have provided, uh, we are supporting the reform of the input subsidy program. Uh, so that includes the technical assistance to design a pilot, a mechanism that repurposes public support towards adoption of practices that actually improve soil health and delivers ecosystem services. I guess you see the parallel that we have been discussing here. No? I mean, we are repurposing exactly in that direction. And we think that this change is very much critical for the long-term productivity uh, sustainability and resilience of agriculture and the food system of uh, Malawi. Also, we have our food systems land use and restoration impact program, which is funded by the GEF. I mean, uh, also putting money there. Uh, so we are working to drive changes. Um, so I'm taking a step back a little bit for Malawi. We are working to drive change across eight key commodities, uh, livestock, cocoa, coffee, maize, palm oil, rice, soy, and wheat, uh, with the aim of making their production more sustainable for the long term, restoring ecosystems and landscape and driving reforestation. So besides Food Systems 2030, also with the GEF, we're working, I mean, to move this agenda in uh, the same direction. Um, finally, uh, to increase the awareness of the relevance of food systems for climate change mitigation, and also to promote, I mean, the massive scaling up in financing and action required. We have been working on a new flagship report that actually will be launched on Food Day at the COP, uh, December 10. The, uh, the title is Recipe for a Livable Planet, Achieving Net Zero Emissions in the Agri-Food System. And as I said, I mean, the, uh, we, we will provide a sneak preview on December 10th, and then early uh, 2024, we will do the uh, full launch and release of it. I mean, this is actually for the first time in the bank uh, that we will come up with a roadmap that will actually lay out the pathways for low, middle, and high-income co countries to reduce emissions across the food system while providing food for the world's population and also increasing uh, resilience. There's some interesting numbers there. I'm making some promotion for the event on December 10th. Actually, it's in our pavilion, the World Bank pavilion, not far from here. Um, so, um, of course, we recognize that partnerships are critical. Uh, what I presented actually was uh, reflecting the partnership that we have. We are very much committed to working with all stakeholders. Uh, very important, as you were mentioning as well, community participation. We need actually to bring in the voice of the farmers because if actually we cannot explain what we do to farmers, actually it's, gonna not, it's, it's not going to be sustainable and it's not going to be taken up by farmers. So I'm very inspired what I've seen today. Uh, I think this is a other step forward uh, in the right direction of food systems transformation in support of healthy people, healthy people, planet and economy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Van Nieuwkoop, for already stressing the importance, indeed, of the repurposing agenda. And it's great to hear that already in 30 countries this is ongoing. Also, you already gave us a little bit of an insight in what's happening currently in Malawi, and that's why I have my colleague Bruce Campbell standing with me, who has been uh, working with uh, World Bank and, and BMZ support and the national government of Malawi to, to implement this agenda. So please, Bruce, take us a little bit through the work there. Great. So I don't have many, many minutes. I may talk a little bit too fast. Uh, we're launching this policy brief today from input subsidies to compensating farmers for soil health practices, services. It was done jointly with uh, people from the national government in Malawi, Farmers Union, World Bank, um, uh, civil society organizations, the policy think tank in Malawi. So this is a shocking statistic from Malawi where importing maize would be five times less expensive than importing inorganic fertilizer for maize production. You know, that's a shocking number from a particular season in Malawi. And I'm not saying that we should import maize. I'm saying that we have to get the agricultural system working better in Malawi. And one of the reasons why this is the case is fertilizer use for efficiency has really gone down because of constant application of fertilizer without the soil ameliorative practices that are needed to go with it. Soils have lost organic matter, have acidified, and yet the solutions actually, we know a lot of the solutions to the problems. While the workers in Malawi, these are on soils of the ancient Gondwana land, and they're they very particular soils of southern Africa, difficult to cultivate, sandy, acidic, low in or, or, uh, organic matter. So the work in Malawi, we hope, is going to be lessons for this vast area of southern Africa. The potential solution is 
thinking about repurposing public policy, in, in particular the inorganic fertil subsidies, and in particular some sort of payment for environmental services. And this is a picture from Costa Rica, I think, where they have been the leaders in these payment sy systems. Mostly for water, biodiversity, and carbon, soil health hasn't really been on the agenda in terms of a payment scheme. So what we imagine in Malawi, we've gone through a stakeholder process with the government, with the World Bank supporting, with the Farmers Union, with many different civil society organizations. And what we're proposing is something like this. So there's this huge pot of money which currently goes to fertilizer subsidies. What we are suggesting that some of it, it's not efficient as a social protection measure. Some of it should go to thinking about social protection for the poorest of the poor. This is, so fertilizer subsidies are not gonna go away, so we believe that they will still, in the, in the stepwise process, there will still be fertilizer subsidies for the next couple of years. But let's put some of the money aside for a bonus payment for farmers. And if we can get this bonus payment working correctly, we believe we can bring in international carbon finance as well. So five quick features. We are, we've, we've been through a design process with the stakeholders and with farmers. We propose that there'd be a portfolio of practices that farmers can choose from in order to comply with the payment system. We've put a verification system in place. These are usually super expensive and all the money from the finance goes into the verification. So we, we want to try and work with the National Extension Service as a first step and have a very light independent verifier on top of that. We would, we would hope that the bonuses get paid to farmers in the growing season towards the harvest at the time when cash and food are in short supply. We would hope that it's going to be digitally administered, which is going to be a challenge, but we think it's possible. And we, we think that it should be implemented over something like a three-year period to allow farmers to transition into a different way of doing business. So what, what do we see the role for development partners in this kind of thing? The one thing we think is establishing pilot schemes because there's a lot of learning net needed. Supporting repurposing agendas. So governments are interested in policy change and how do we change it? How do we do it? Supporting the longer term monitoring. If we do get a payment system working in Malawi, we cannot afford the kind of detailed monitoring that will be needed. We need a separate stream of finance to, to look at actual soil health outcomes. And facilitating public-private partnerships. So for example, in Malawi, a key thing is to bring in more legumes into the system. But if you can't sell the legumes, it's not going to work. So how do you step up legume production and consumption in the country? How do you have processing uh, facilities in the country? And so the next steps for us is build the PES model for Malawi in the next couple of months, develop a digital system and verification system, implement a large-scale pilot, hopefully in the 24-25 growing season, really get some good monitoring of what actually happens on the ground, so that we can take these lessons to other countries in the regions where there's very similar livelihood and soil conditions. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Bruce. And you left us a little bit with a teaser there on the next step. So uh, I would like to welcome everyone here in the room to check out the, the policy paper that has been launched today. It should be accessible on our website, which is climeat.org. I'm looking at you, Leon. Good. Great. And then hopefully we'll hear from Bruce in the near future on what has actually happened with the next step that he just uh, presented. Uh, so with that, we come to the end of this session. I would like to thank you all for your participation and a special thanks to all the participants of the session and the speakers. Um, this was not the last session in the Food Systems Pavilion today, so actually this is a part of a, a group of sessions that we'll be organizing as Climate. So later on today we'll have a session on equitable food systems and a session together with the World Trade Organization on the nexus between trade and food, which will also be happening here. So you're very much welcome to, uh, to come back to those sessions. Uh, and I believe that the coffee has finally arrived in the pavilion, so feel free to grab a, a free cup of coffee and have a good discussion. So thank you all very much.